All right, today we're going to be talking about close reading and text-dependent questions and how they relate to our classrooms and our students and how we can improve our instruction by using close reading and text-dependent questions. In our language arts standards, we have three main shifts in literacy. Um, basically, we're looking at increasing our amount and um, really having focus on content rich nonfiction. Uh, a huge emphasis, about 80 to 90 percent of our standards are focusing on providing evidence, the reading standards are provi providing evidence from the text, and then also really looking at the academic language and the use of that language in our different content areas. And so when we started off with the Common Core Standards, the first year we were deconstructing, we were getting used to the new standards, um, and just really seeing what they meant and how we were going to use those in the classroom. The second year, we got even deeper, really looking at some strategies like LBC as a way to teach our standards. And then finally, this year, we're really getting very, very specific, looking at specific strategies, digging even deeper. And two of those tools to use are close reading and text-dependent questions. So when you think about close reading, we all know close reading was ZE, but close reading is different, C-L-O-S-E reading, is really a close examination of the text. So it's causing students to really go back and analyze the text at a deeper level, to go back really into linger over portions of the text, to really see how the words fit together, how the phrases, what the author's purpose was, how key ideas um, and details kind of build into formative parts of the text. And so it's that close examination, that rereading of text. I think about it a lot of times, just like a movie. If you watch something in a movie and it's confusing or you get to the end and you're kind of wondering, you know, what just happened there? We kind of hit that rewind button and we go back and we watch it a little bit closer. We re-examine it. We see how those parts and pieces fit together. That's exactly what we're asking the students to do with close reading. When we look for close reading and text-dependent questions, these are really anchored in our standards. And so we're looking at extracting evidence, making inferences, um, having students read complex text, looking for central idea and theme, comparing two or more text, and really looking at evidence to support students' conclusions. Uh, we've got two short little videos about close reading and text-dependent questions that we're going to look at, and then we'll go ahead and really kind of take this into practice and look at how to write um, text-dependent questions. Hold on just a second, technical difficulties. <laughs> And he's just telling about um, close reading and text dependent questions and how those function with our um, core content standards. Common core standards, sorry. Hi, I'm Josh Bickdoll with McGraw Hill Education, and I'm talking today to Douglas Fisher about close reading and how it relates to the Common Core State Standards. So Doug, how would you describe close reading? How would you define it? A close reading is a careful and purposeful reading. Well, actually, it's a rereading. It's a careful and purposeful rereading of a text. It's an encounter with a text where students really focus on what the author had to say, what the author's purpose was, what the words mean, what the structure of the text tells us. It really is getting to what Louise Rosenblatt talked about as a transaction between the reader and the text. Louise Rosenblatt, the originator of reader response theory, really talked about understanding what the author had to say and not impugning those author's words, but really getting what the author had to say and bringing some of your own ideas to bear on that text. In a close reading, we have to have students reread the text. We give them questions, text-dependent questions, that require that they go back into the text and search for answers. These aren't simply recall questions, just the facts of the text, but rather questions that allow students to think about the text and the author's purpose and the structure and the flow of the text. Close reading 
requires those students actually think and understand what they're reading. Thanks, Doug. That was a great answer. My second question for you has to do with Common Core State Standards and close reading. So is close reading part of addressing the Common Core State Standards? Can you elaborate? Close reading isn't in the Common Core State Standards. However, an analysis of the Common Core State Standards really says you've got to learn the text well. The Common Core State Standards require that students provide evidence and justification for their answers. The only way we know how students can do this, that they really learn to provide evidence and justification, is if they closely read. When we have students really read carefully, they pay attention to the words, the ideas, the structure, the flow and the purpose of that text, they're ready to answer more complex questions that require that they really think about what the author said and compare that with what they know, what they believe, and what they think. Doug, thank you so much for talking to me today about close reading and the Common Core State Standards. So tune in next time, we'll talk to Doug about what close reading looks like in the classroom. So stay tuned, thank you. Fisher talking about close reading and what it looks like in the classroom. So Doug, can you explain what you would expect to see in the classroom where they are practicing close reading? What does close reading look like? There are a variety of ways to teach students through close reading in a classroom. Most of the time that involves selecting a short passage of text, having students encounter the text first without any kind of pre-teaching or any kind of front-loading, maybe pointing out a couple of really complex words, but really letting students encounter that text the first time. Inviting them to read that text, asking them some text-dependent questions, which might be about the key details, the general understanding, the structure, the vocabulary, the author's purpose, but inviting them back into that text several times one of the things we know with the close reading is that students read with a pencil. Well, not literally with a pencil, but with argumentation. The students are regularly taking notes as they read. They're, they're extracting ideas and concepts that they want to remember from the text. And that reading with a pencil helps students go back into the text over and over again to really get a strong sense of what that author is trying to say. In a close reading, students also talk about what they're thinking about. They share their evidence with peers. They use argumentation. They agree. They disagree. They ask for evidence. They provide evidence. They offer counterclaims. It's that give and take of discussion in which the text serves as a primary tool for forwarding that conversation. That's what we're looking for in a classroom that has a close reading. In addition, teachers can model during close reading. Students notice things that are confusing for them. They notice things that they understand, and they notice things that were difficult. When the teacher notices that a lot of students have the same misunderstanding, the teacher can build that into some of the modeling and talk about how the teacher thinks the text is working, how the teacher is noticing vocabulary or structures or general ideas. And then ask another text and a question to drive the students back to the text to look for additional evidence. It's an ongoing and recursive process where students go back to the text based on the questions they're asked, including up to inferencing questions, where students go back to the text to look for evidence and really grasp a deep level of understanding of that text. Thank you so much, Doug, for all of your great information and insights into close reading and the Common Core State Standards. Uh, that's my interview with Doug Fisher. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you have some great knowledge and some great things you can take back to the classroom with you. Thank you, and have a great day. Close reading, it's very 
Um, it's an intentional process in which you know students are expected to go back and reread. They're expected to use that text. They're expected to go back and extract evidence from that text to use um, to support their thinking and to support you know questions that they are answering. And so you really want students, when you're looking at close reading, you really want them to pay attention to how that text unfolds. And we do that by using those text-dependent questions that require students to go back to the text to find information. We also want to be very strategic as teachers when we use text-dependent questions to lead students to success and then also to push them to deeper levels of thinking and deeper understanding of meaning. Uh, we want to really look at the t kinds of reading tasks that you know students are going to have after they graduate. Things that they're going to encounter in the real world. Things, you know, the type of reading and the type of question they're going to, going to encounter in their daily lives. Um, and we also really want to pay close attention to the writing. Um, looking at close dependent questions, we're really having students read like writers or read like detectives. And they're really looking not just to see what the reading says, but why did the author make the choices that he or she made to put this particular text together? Why did they choose a particular picture? Why did they choose a particular graphic? Um, why did they choose a particular writing style in writing their particular in their passage? <clears throat> All right, this time if you would turn in your packet and on the fifth page. There's a passage from Alice in Wonderland, and um, we're going to read that first, just so you're able to kind of put in context what exactly text-dependent questions are and what they are not. So I want to give you just a few minutes to go through and read the passage, and then we'll flip back to our front sheet. If you'll flip back over when you're finished, that very front sheet, and then we'll talk about text-dependent questions and really kind of see what some models of good text-dependent questions are and then what some are not. to text-dependent questions reside in the actual text. That students have to go back and they have to pull evidence and they really have to um, show their thinking through supporting their thinking with evidence from the text. So some questions that are not text-dependent questions. So really good to kind of look at what they're not and then we're going to look at what they are. What we want to get away from is instruction um, where students really don't even have to read the text. And we found that some in the past, that we give them so much information or we ask questions that are so far out of the text, they really don't even have to read these to actually answer the questions. So, an example would be, are books without pictures or conversations useful? Um, how would you react if you saw a talking rabbit? What do you know about Lewis Carroll? Now these questions are fine for discussion, they're fine for extension, they might be fine for a journal topic, but if we're actually assessing our reading standards, these questions do not require students to have read the text at all. They do not require them to use any evidence from the text, and the student can answer these questions without having ever looked at the text ever. So what we want to do, if you look at the second gray box at the top of your first page, um, is we want to constantly refer students back to the text, make them do that um, rewinding and rereading. And so, asking, what kind of books does Alice find useful? How did Alice react when she saw a talking rabbit? Why did Alice follow the rabbit down the hole? And what does the reader know about the rabbit? When we ask text-dependent questions, it really requires students, they can't, they can't answer these unless they've read the passage. And so it's crucial that we ask questions that make students prove their knowledge, prove that they've read. We also really want to look at critical thinking and higher level thinking with text dependent questions. Because yes, a right there question like what color is Alice's dress, you do have to have read the text, 
but that's not the level of thinking that we're looking at with our common core seniors. So we want to make sure that the questions we ask are also um, showing depth. So if you'll flip over to the back second page. Um, we can see really that all of these questions, just by saying, you know, referring back to Alice several times, going back and asking why, looking at what do we know as a reader, those key words are crucial to directing students back to the text. And that's what we have to do as teachers when we're writing text-dependent questions. And so text-dependent questions, they do not rely on personal opinion, on background information, or on just imaginative speculation. And so students should be able to answer these questions um, just based on evidence of what they read in the text. So when you think about text-dependent questions, you want to really make sure that when you're writing these questions, you're engaging students at higher levels of thinking. Um, you're finding your answers by extracting evidence from the text. And so it may really, you may have to linger over one particular sentence, or you may have to linger over a paragraph. You may be picking and pulling, you may be making an inference and having to support with evidence from throughout the text. But we also really want to make sure that they're very aligned to our common core state standards. And so on that back page in the center, there's a light gray box and it gives us our anchor standards, two through nine. So when we're writing text-dependent questions, we're using standards two through nine to really come up with and find uh, the questions that we're going to ask. So you look at your anchor standard, and then you can, to get the specific verbiage, go to your specific grade level standard. But when you look at your anchor standards, you're looking for things like, how does a key word or key phrase you know, function in this particular passage. Um, what type of supporting ideas and details does the author use to develop an idea? Specific word choices, how do they shape meaning or tone? Looking at figurative language, figurative meanings, and seeing you know, what those mean in the text. With standard nine, we're looking at two or more texts and maybe making a comparison of those two. And so we want to make sure when we're writing text-based questions, that we always go back to our standards. Now, an example of this with the Alice in Wonderland passage. For example, if we want to look, and this is at the bottom box on uh, the second page, if we wanted to look at standard four and really analyze how a specific word choice shapes tone, we would look at standard four, really look for a specific word or phrase that caught our eye as a reader, and Writing text-dependent questions requires us as teachers to also be close readers. So we have to really look for words and phrases that stand out, where, you know, places where there's pivotal meaning. Uh, so for example, we could ask, why wasn't Alice burning with curiosity when she initially saw the rabbit? What events led her to feeling this way? Standard six, there's an example of point of view uh, and looking at a particular sentence. So in the opening paragraph, Alice states, what's the use of a book without pictures or conversation? What does that sentence reveal about her? So the reader's having to make some inferences based on that evidence and based on the facts from the text. And then finally, we have standard two, looking at a particular um, word or phrase. And our question is around which word or phrase does the meaning of the third paragraph pivot? And explain that with evidence. So if you'll flip back over to your Alice in Wonderland passage. Look at paragraph three. And if you have table partners, you can discuss. Um, but looking at paragraph three, really think about what word or phrase does the meaning of that paragraph, or where does it shift or pivot? Okay, so around which word or phrase does the meaning of the third paragraph pivot? When you find it, Circle it. Then after you circle it, go through and underline evidence that supports your thinking.
Now, hopefully one thing that you've seen in this process and kind of heard, you know, with people discussing is that, you know, there's some concern about right and wrong. And there's some worry about, you know, did I pick the right thing? Did I pick the same thing as the group next to me? And that's very significant in the fact that in this particular instance, this is an open question, much like our extended responses. And so as long as you can pick a word that you know would be a valid answer for where that paragraph would pivot um, and back that up with evidence and justify your thinking, then that's just like one of our extended responses. You don't have to worry about a true right or wrong. So take just a few moments and just discuss what are some of those factors at this point? You know, what word did you pick? And what evidence did your groups provide to be able to justify that thinking? And then just have some discussions among yourselves um, with why that's significant or why that you know is much higher level thinking than just asking what color is Alice's dress. about text dependent questions um, <clears throat> there's really a progression um, we do still have those key ideas those general understandings and so those are valid questions but we really want to push to push students thinking to this higher level where they're really looking at the author's purpose they're making inferences uh, they're forming opinions and arguments and backing those up with evidence from what they've read and so all of these are crucial skills that we really want to build up to this highest level where students are really asking you know, and being able to answer questions that show depth. So now we want to put it into practice. Um, on the third page of your handout packet, there is a text dependent question worksheet. And what I want us to do first is kind of go through those steps. Uh, you can see first you have to frame your text dependent question. So you're making that decision after you've read a passage. Why did this author choose a particular word? Why did they use this sentence and what does it mean to the text? Going through and collecting evidence, looking for pivotal points or patterns. So we're first deciding what type of question would fit this particular passage or you know, what really stands out to us and how could we frame that as a text-dependent question. Then you can see steps one, two, and three down at the bottom. You're first checking that the question has a text-based focus. And you can see that those um, steps are aligned with our standards, which is a crucial point. Uh, eventually, you know, this, we sort of internalize this chart, but it's a really handy tool to use at first just to make sure that you're uh, writing text-dependent questions and gives you a guideline really on how to write those and how to formulate those particular questions. So what we're going to do next is there's a passage. Um, this is the passage from Bats at the Beach, and it's just the two opening stanzas. Um, even though this is a picture book, the Lexile in this book is a 720. Um, and so when we look at this particular stanza, um, you're looking at those close reading strategies. And so even though this is an entire picture book, has many, many stanzas, we're only looking at the first two because we're practicing our close reading skills. And so as you go through looking at this packet and as we go through working with it, you're gonna see short passages and you're gonna think, well, you know, when we have assessment or when students get a real passage, they're much longer. And that's very true. And that's because this is just an exercise in close reading. So we're taking just little bits and pieces of the passage and really closely examining them. So if you'll take just a few minutes and go through, read the first two stanzas of Bats at the Beach. Then once you're ready, go back to your text dependent questioning worksheet and you're going to write a text-dependent question, one for each stanza. Okay, so remember you're thinking about words or phrases, sentence, making inferences based on evidence. So just take a few moments, uh, work in groups, and 
go through and write two questions, one per stanza, practicing with text-dependent questions.